Hello, what is up, Generals? We are back with Ultimate General Civil War, and this is the JNP Diet Legendary Union playthrough. We're attacking the uh, skirmish, side battle, whatever, of River Crossing uh, today. Now, I hate this battle. Hate it. And it's, it's, it's just a real pain. Um, I don't normally include in my videos uh, my experimentation process. I, I usually just cut to the final, um, the final attempt. I tend to, for the most part, be able to attack these uh, battles, you know, kind of one and done. Um, but with this particular fight, we're on probably my third sit down uh, for the, for this session that I recorded here. We're on my third sit down uh, with the fight, with this battle. Um, I've struggled to come up with an approach. And I know, you know, partially it's it's because we're on Legendary. Partially it's because of the changes to the AI's charge logic. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about what the battle is asking you to do. And then how we can approach this fight uh, with the mindset of the rebalance mod in particular now in the vanilla game uh the ai is very aggressive you can more or less just set up on the top of the hill up there where the confederate skirmishers are and you can just kind of blast away and they'll keep coming at you until you you take them down you now gun their artillery too uh but in the rebel those skirmishers in particular are persnickety at best and if you just post up up there the ai is too smart uh they'll never they'll never come running at you Essentially, they won't they won't attack your your hilltop position. So you uh, you know blast away for a couple hours in game, uh, taking out the cannon that are defending the northern hilltop. Uh, and then you try and cross the river, and those skirmishers are still more or less intact because you can't see them from the hilltop, uh, and you you just take insane losses crossing the river your men are exhausted uh and if you ever trip the flag even if you've been battering the defenders with artillery the entire time uh the folks defending the southern flag come streaming up and because they're confederate space marines they don't care about anything and you're still fighting with you know fat shopkeepers and whatnot so you're just you're just done before the fight even really begins and they just waltz through your line like it's nothing uh <laughs> so I'm not better. So uh, I've tried to have a sit down with this fight. This is my third time with it, trying a couple of different you know, iterations of, well, what happens if I go south, essentially? What happens if I try and take the lower flag uh, instead of the northern flag? And I think ultimately I, I, I do not think that that's a viable strategy. I Right now with the way the game is, is balanced and everything like that, I just... I don't see it. Let's put it that way, which is amusing because I think in the vanilla game, that was actually the preferred, uh, in the vanilla game, that was the preferred means to approach this fight. Um, but, you know, hey, here we are. Uh, so, I think I mentioned in the last video that I got a new job. Uh, I'm a couple weeks in now and, you know, still, still getting settled, obviously. But one of the things that I've had to kind of make that transition to is, is, you know, I'm not a consultant anymore. I have a little less control over my free time, and I'm also in a in a new relationship. So, <laughs> like both those two things together, my time is uh, less my own than it was. Let's say. So, um, I've I've uh, only had a couple hours whenever I sit down to play, and then I only have a probably like twice a week that I can really give give this game you know my mental energy uh where i'm not either burned out from work or just kind of distracted going other places in my life so um i i was actually pretty pretty happy with with how this fight ultimately ended up uh playing out i do not believe this is the attempt that that we're watching right now i don't think this is the attempt that that does it but it it sort of opens my eyes to a possible strategy and my thought process here, because I recorded this last night, um, is 
Oh, hey, look, they're attacking me. Um, I think, you know, you look at this battle, and what do you have? So you're fighting on uh, the northern part of the map that will eventually be Gaines Mill. And you're essentially fighting where the Confederates enter the board in Gaines Mill. And so the CSA here is kind of defending the territory that you're going to be defending uh, in a couple of major battles. But you're not there yet. And so when we get to Gaines Mill, I'll call out what we're doing in, in terms of defensive terrain. But the, the, the call to action for you is to enter this board uh, on the top left and to take one or both of the hills. You do not need both of them to win. One will do the trick. Uh, and as you can see, there are quite a few defenders. Uh, on well, we'll see later as the battle unfolds the the, re the real attempt. There are quite a few defenders on this map um, for for both the northern and the southern flag, but you can already kind of see that there's a, a great deal of force defending the northern flag, uh, and that's just one of the forces you have to deal with on this battle. Uh, you, you know, I have at this point in time a like a decent mix of veteran and non-veteran troops. Um, and I've got First Ohio, for example. And, uh, obviously, they're they're my baby unit. I, mean, I live in Ohio, so they're going to be my the unit that I, you know, treat as like the first infantry, right? And that's just kind of the thing. Uh, and um, so what what we end up doing here, and I realize like uh, my big attempt is to try and get the AI to attack me where I'm strong, which is to say on this side of the river with artillery. And obviously, if you post up with your whole army, they're not going to do it because they're not stupid. Um, but if they think they have a shot at getting across the river, they'll try. And so paradoxically to my general advice, which is, which is nominally uh, I recommend to people who ask, that you keep your command as close together as possible so that when or if you find yourself committed in battle and you have an opportunity, you have the Schwerpunkt to kind of see that particular push through and counter to my usual advice in that regard. In this particular battle, I actually encourage what would be kind of a feint. Uh, the feint in implies some degree of maneuver, so I suppose that term isn't entirely accurate, but it's a, a ruse, a clever ruse. Notice I've deployed only three brigades forward, and they are all zero-star brigades. Now, as far as I'm aware, the AI does actually take into account the strength or the experience of the units that it's attacking. Also notice that the two batteries, Prague, Prague, and Crutchfield, are also advancing because they don't have range where they're currently posted. So... Um, I'm essentially deploying my rookies forward because I expect them to be doing the brunt of the fighting at this point. And I pause really quick to grab a drink because um, I think, hey, I think we're onto something. This is the one, or at least, you know, a version of the one. We'll see how it plays out. And Stonewall's Brigade and Campbell come screaming at me. And this, this is why I want them to fight me here. This is why, watch what happens. This is why I've been trying to engineer a means with which to con to bait the AI into an attack. The ground, the defensive terrain here is perfect. They have to come up a very steep hill, over a river, and in open terrain. And I'm on a hilltop shooting down. That was two two-star units. And I've got rookies zero star rookies and we send them running now I'm, I'm scooching some of my artillery up you notice that because they attack whenever the infantry enemy infantry gets within a certain distance of that recon point that 5th Michigan's currently occupying they I lose control of it and therefore I lose sight so for right now I can only see uh, it's not Prague actually it's like pork maybe um, or whatever 
the other battery. So I can't see crutch field or can field or, you know, whatever. Um, but, all right, so now we're starting to kind of see what I was talking about in the other previous attempts. You see just how much of a force they have defending this crossing. Here, there's crutch field. So you've got Trimble's two, two brigades coming at me. Um, and we only have one Stonewall and one Campbell, which is nice, but there are three or four units of skirmishers on this map, too, also uh, defending uh, the flag. So, or not flag, defending the river. Um, and again, we, we, the, our, the infantry comes forward, and, and we shoot them. Now, the terrain here is still exposed. But there's no real good way in my read to uh, to engage the foe without being exposed. So I know for a while there's going to be some artillery fire that I just have to accept. Which is partially why I have my rookies forward. Um, eventually, when it's safe to do so, I will uh, detach skirmishers from one of the units and try and have them go far forward and eat artillery for a while because skirmishers take less damage from, from shell, shell or shot, etc. Um, and so the hope there is to mitigate or reduce the incoming damage as much as possible. It's, uh, you know, of, of, of varying degrees of success, obviously, but uh, the hope, the thought, the plan is to mitigate as best as I can manage the, the damage coming in. Uh, there's going to be, you know, I'm going to get hit no matter what I do. So it's, it's more a question of how do I get around what's coming than, than anything else. Uh, I start gently pushing the artillery forward now that I have an idea of where their artillery is going to deploy. Um, and then I engage the skirmisher unit with um, first Pennsylvania Dragoons and the Pennsylvania Long Rifles and the second Wisconsin. Looks like a good deal if my light units are coming from Pennsylvania, which, uh, having been to Pennsylvania and seen the terrain in that, in that uh, gorgeous state, makes sense. <laughs> it, is a, uh, it is not a flat state. <laughs> so, it, you know, it makes sense that, that would be the people there would, would you know, make better uh, light troops than line, line infantry. <clears throat> Woodsmen, hunters, etc. that kind of thing. So I pull back the 5th Michigan. They've had their turn in the barrel for a while. Um, and unfortunately, the artillery decides that the long rifles are the best target. Now, I wanted them to shoot the New, New York Zouaves or the main infantry. Um, and they choose to not do that, essentially. So then they start piling away shots at the Wisconsin boys, which is okay because they're in the woods. I'd prefer a different target, but, you know, it's, it's I mean, someone's going to get shot. It's just, it's someone's turn on the barrel and there's no way around it. There's no way that I've found to attack across this river and not just take atrocious losses. And so this is what I do. I start pulling 5th Michigan back. I start pulling the main boys back. And, and what does the AI do? They say, aha, they've abandoned the hilltop. Let's go get them, lads. Or they, you know, they, they say something more like, we'll show those yanks or something and they come in and so it's going to be kind of repetitive but you get the thesis of my operation at this point is this is kind of what the battle is going to be is just back and forth and back and forth I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this until at least I get the cannon out of here um, and and then uh when they get near the river, I obviously I don't want the, the New York Zouaves to engage alone. So I, I rush forward with Michigan and Maine boys. Um, and, and they give them the cold steel from the wintry lands of both Michigan and or Maine, as the case might be. Both states uh, beautiful, but, uh, but Canadian-like in their, in their temperament. Um, so the cold steel is probably very accurate for them. Although if I'm probably not mistaken, that would have more likely been a, a phraseology with, with regard to the bayonet than the mini ball, which if I'm not mistaken is paper or something like that. Um, this is essentially the plan 
for the battle is until I can get rid of their guns, uh, I'm trying to bait them to attack. And then I'm going to shoot downhill at them, and they're going to, you know, uh, I should probably take a half a step back so that they're in the water when I shoot them. But I actually kind of want these firefights to drag out a little longer, if that makes sense. Um, this is not about shattering their morale. They're, it's, it's about killing them. Uh, and then eventually shattering their morale. But um, the way that the shatter slash surrender mechanics are wired uh they won't they they won't below uh, above a certain hit point threshold so i need to whittle them down i need to kill the soldiers in the unit get his hp down low enough that it's no longer above that um uh, shatter resistance threshold and then and then it's it, it is open to shattering so now that I'm not being actively attacked, I push forward with the new the, the Zuovs, and they get shot by artillery for a while. Uh, you know, it's, it's obviously shit for them. But the thing is, is that even though it sucks, like the losses that they take are less than the losses that a formed brigade would take. And so this is the thing that I can do that is going to reduce as much as possible the damage coming in. Uh, I for a while there, I try and put them in cover. That's a mistake. And then I bait this this great big attack. Uh, it's Trimble one and two, Stonewall, Campbell staying back to guard the artillery. And so I'm like, oh, okay, this could be a real knockdown knockdown drag out. Except I think they're wise to my my my, my game now. Uh, and so Trimble one and Stonewall pull back. Uh, although Trimble two still keeps coming in. So it's an opportunity for uh, the two Pennsylvania light units. New York and Wisconsin to put rounds uh, downrange on Trimble. And then, you know, fingers crossed, we can either pull back again and bait uh, a second attempt by Stonewall and Trimble 1 uh, to come in for the attack and or Campbell. Uh, there are Confederate units that I have not even become aware of yet that are remaining to try and fight me. So this is, like I said, this is quite... Quite the quite the fight. There's a there's a pretty significant force defending this river crossing, uh, which is supposed to be a side battle. I want to add where we have an entire at this point in time Union Corps engaged with arguably a Confederate Corps in a knockdown dragout for control of this river crossing, um, and we're not even at Shiloh yet. So yeah, you know the war has escalated quickly. We can say. Uh, if we go to the earlier conversations I've had on this channel about the game, I think, was originally designed that these would be regiments. I feel a little better about that as a concept. If this was a divisional engagement, I'd feel a little bit less like, what the hell? I also uh, think that if you look at, like, Ultimate A uh, Admiral Age of Sail, where the units there are very small... Um, they almost certainly more represent uh, a regiment than a, a brigade. Although, uh, in fairness, uh, that is appropriate for the era. Um, Age of Sail, if I'm not mistaken, takes place predominantly in the period of the American Revolution and or the Barbary Wars. And uh, infantry units just were not that large uh, in that time period. That's predominantly a space of logistics question right like i'm sure the, the british royal marines would have loved to have uh you know a couple hundred marines aboard those vessels but at that point in time you know shelf stable food was hard to come by it was expensive uh let alone potable water on a voyage like that let alone you know birthing space and the bigger the more men you have the bigger the ship has to be the bigger the ship is the slower it goes the slower it goes the more food you have to bring along like it's it's this never-ending balancing act that they would have had to make. So it, it was a truism for pretty much every major player in the Caribbean uh, that, that operations were generally small, uh, just as a matter of course, right? And and here we go, another, another big push. This is uh, Stonewall and Campbell, and Trimble sitting this one out, reasonably so. One of the one of the things that uh, allowed armies to explode in size in this era. This has nothing to do with guns or bullets. 
everything to do with canned food, which we can thank Napoleon for, I think. Uh, or the, at least the French. Um, don't 100% quote me on that, but there was, a, I believe, a competition, and somebody invented a process to canned food, and, you know, it's one of the things that allowed shelf-stable food. You know, in the Union, they had a lot of hardtack and crap like that, but there was, there was also canned food. And this allowed armies to remain on the road longer. And if they ran out of those kinds of supplies, and they were still not cheap yet, they had to resort to foraging, and foraging is politically unpopular, and it typically makes you very unpopular with the local populace. Imagine being a an American citizen in a Confederate army. Uh, let's say, let's say a colonel. You know, because there are dime a dozen in the Confederate army. The colonel comes to you with this monopoly money, as far as you're concerned, and says, you know. We're confiscating all this food for the cars, and we're going to give you, we'll pay you in fair market value for it. They've just given you toilet paper, as far as you're concerned, because you can't spend it anywhere. And, you know, they've taken an entire fiscal quarter's worth of product from your farm or whatever. So foraging, stay away from that if you're an army. That's bad, bad news. Don't live off the land. Living off the land sounds good on paper, but it's a mistake. Um... It's one of the reasons the British were so successful in the Napoleonic period. Old Boney lived off the land, right? That's what that's what you do. Because Army Mobile, light, nice light supply chain. Uh, but um, Wellington insisted on paying for everything because he wanted to get the French or the uh, the Portuguese and the Spaniards loyal on his side they didn't feel like they were getting screwed out of the deal he paid them in local either local strip or or, or gold or silver or whatever um, way off topic here but the, I mean the, what you're seeing on the screen is kind of boring it's the same thing over and over and over again until eventually I feel safe to cross the river which uh, is actually not where this battle ends believe it or not like once I get across the river and establish myself the fight has really only just begun um this is, I mean, like, this approach to the fight is actually pretty exciting, I think. Uh, there's a lot of cool back and forth. There's a lot of maneuver. I've been worried about recording this fight um, because it has the potential to be really boring. Like, one of the attempts I recorded, there was six hours of me at triple, sp triple, fast, triple fast forward bombarding them until I ran out of supply. That was it. I just sat there. What was I going to talk about for that kind of time timeline? Like it was, I, I would have had to cut the video and be like, we get here, and we shoot, now I'm just going to fast forward until it's done. Because you have until like, so it's if it's 1621 in game right now, you have until like, I want to say 2000. Like it's, it's, it's maybe, maybe, yeah, like 8 o'clock or so. You got a while. Anyway, long story short, you got a minute. Um, which in this particular fight I, I really do think that you need to milk every single second that you're here so that's like why I think like trying to get those folks to attack you is is, is the right the right move um, you have all this time and if all you're doing is letting your artillery do all the killing then your infantry isn't helping and the battle's gonna take that much longer. And the dream for me is for as many of these defending brigades as practical be shattered before you even cross. Uh, and the reason I say that is it's a big army. And if, if this Union army tries to engage it, at musket range, it's it's gonna lose. We're just not ready yet. We're just not able to fight toe to toe with the Confederates yet. Union infantry is fragile, and it just cannot be utilized in the same kind of ballsy manner that you would have kind of taken for granted as a Confederate commander. You have to use logistics. You have to use the large, the, the lar larger size of your army. You have to utilize the fact that in many of these battles, you're allowed to bring more. 
You're just given more slots because the game knows that what you're bringing is less, like less quality. Um, and, you know, like you can also get away with not really expending a great deal of effort on like things like uh, put, uh, politics. Because the Union Army is just big. It's just a big force. So you've got to stack the deck as much as you can in your favor. And that's what I do here. I, I, this is kind of a risk. This is a ballsy play. Um, but I, I'm getting ready to think about crossing the river. The reason I say it's a ballsy play is I've pulled all of my infantry off the front. And I'm trying to get them to come at my cannon because I, I want to make a really juicy target. Uh, and it works. They, they come at me, but like Trimble... Trimble 1, Campbell, I think eventually Trimble 2, I want to say. Uh, and I, and I want to keep in mind that the entire time this fight's going down, there are skirmisher units that I just can't see on the other side of this river. Just ready to go, waiting for me. I feel very hampered by Zero Recon right now. Like, I feel, I feel, I miss, I miss Recon badly in this fight. Um, and I, I don't know if I'm... I don't know if, when I'm going to have the chance to really afford recon. I, I think certainly after Shiloh of that I have no doubt. Um, but the question I have is, do I put the points in recon between Shiloh and Gaines Mill? That's kind of where I'm leaning. Because um, at this point in time, our logistics and our army org are pretty good. We're, we're at AO uh, 4 right now. I... I put the last pip you win in this battle into AO, so I'm at AO5. After Bull Run, I put um, the points you get there into logistics, or no, uh, economics. And so the reason I did that uh, is, maybe it's logistics, I forget. I think I put him into econ, though. I'm not positive. I put him into econ or logistics. And the, the thought process was, is I didn't need AO5 right away. Like immediately. Or AO4 or 5, whatever. I didn't need it immediately after Bull Run. Right, I had time. I had time to... Uh, I, had, I, I, I could use the two skirmish battles to increase the slots. Because I'm only planning on going to AO5 for Shiloh and then maxing out as much as I can the unit slots in the two core because you're allowed to bring two core to Shiloh as the Union. When I was playing as the Confederates, I needed more points into AO to maximize the number of brigade slots in the one um, core you're allowed to bring. But as the Union, you can bring two. So you can utilize that to your advantage and you probably don't need AO6 or something, right? So you can get away with AO5. So now I've got the crossroads battle, or not the, yeah, the crossroads battle. I can put that last pip into, let's say, Madison. I don't know. I'm not really sure where I'm going to put it. Um, yeah, see, here's one of these, like, invisible skirmisher units. So, which is just, he's just tearing into the zoos, but that's, you know, they're the ones kind of leading the way. Um, I probably did not, I, not probably, I definitely did not uh, orchestrate crossing the river in the best way I could have. I should have crossed in strength, I should have crossed with a wide front, um, I should have certainly crossed with the skirmishers and then let one infantry unit stand where the, the long rifles are now, trading blows with the two skirmisher units down there, but, you know, hey, whenever like, it gets me past the fight, I don't care at this point. But we're, we're having kind of discussions now, like, how do you evolve this army? 
And I think that we're probably at a phase where I need to think about recon sooner rather than later. Because now I think one of the things holding me back is... Because I can buy enough guns. I can, I can buy enough guns these days. So logistics doesn't really need... Isn't super duper high priority to get bumped. Uh, and I have a pretty good amount of like monetary efficiency. I'd like more, so politics isn't off the table, but um, you know, I'm not as worried about it. Uh, so if I'm at where I want to be for AO until at least Gaines Mill, I probably will probably will bump to AO six by Gaines Mill, but for right now I think we're okay. The two logical places for me to put my my points are, like, training, maybe. I can see the argument. Medicine or recon. And, well, okay. D2 are off that topic for a second. This is vital. What I'm doing on the screen right now is absolutely vital. So when you play this fight, you need to do this. Notice how I have not tripped the flag. That's because I'm trying to get in a position. If I trip the flag, the defenders from the no from the southern flag come swarming to the north and they overwhelm you really quickly and honestly, annoyingly easily. And your men are too tired and they're not in position yet. And your artillery isn't in position either to bombard the attackers before they get a chance to get into position. So you need to be very careful about tripping that flag. It is absolutely vital to this mission that you don't trip it before you're ready. Do trip it. Um, A, because if you don't, you lose. But B, because then the AI loses its fucking shit and comes and attacks you. And if you're set up and you're in position and you're ready and you're rested-ish and your artillery is ready to go too, this is great defensive terrain. Where you where we were on the other side of the river is great defensive terrain. Where we're at right now is also great defensive terrain. This map doesn't do a stupendous job of illustrating the, ge the geography of what's going on right now, but... The northern defensive flag, or the northern flag, is on a hilltop. And so you see there's that little flag. There's the farmhouse to the south of it. There's this copse of green wheat or whatever. And then there's the trees where 3rd Illinois is currently located. Almost all of those things are on the cusp of an elevation dip. You can kind of see it on the screen now where there's that shadow kind of illustrating where I can't see. Now, on the one hand, that's an annoying place where the AI can hide units because there's weird LOS there. But on the other hand, again, it's if I'm up there, I'm firing downhill onto that spot. So it's great, great defensive terrain. So you, you can stand there and fight. And then what I'm trying to do with 5th Michigan, for example, is I'm trying to deploy them wide as a counter flanker to 3rd Illinois because the AI will typically attack towards the flag. So you can use a smaller or more whittled unit like 5th Michigan as a flanker um, to kind of spoil the attack. And then 3rd Illinois, who has excellent cover, well, good cover, can kind of tank the fire for a bit while somebody like Michigan you know, knocks Taylor out of the fight. No one's in position yet. Uh, I'm not ready to trip the flag, although you can see that the main unit is uh, is getting into position to do exactly that, and I and I am preparing for that. I'm getting ready for units to come trip the flag. I've got Fiasco in position to offer a morale bonus. I've got Wisconsin to the far uh, Union right, holding the flank down that way to make sure that they don't come screaming up the hill and that I can get flank shots if I need to. Um, I have the rest of the artillery still getting into position, but second uh, second artillery is is in, in the area. Like they could deploy right now and put down um, uh, sh shells if they needed to, and they will, and they will here in, in, in not too much longer. You can see some of the more, like, invisible is sort of a dumb word for it, but yeah. 
there's a whole new Confederate command that is kind of coming out of the woodwork, <laughs> ready to come fight me. But we're we're okay from a condition perspective. We're warmed up, we're tired, but no one's exhausted yet, and we're in position. We have supporting elements more or less ready to go. We have units that are almost but not quite set up. And the most important part is we're not crossing that river under fire. And we're not exhausted. And we're not fighting uphill. We're making them fight uphill every time. So we're undeniably taking losses. The Union commander going into this campaign needs to understand you're going to take losses. Period. And at this point in time, because I have only put a tiny handful of points into training, um, I'm just going to spend the entire campaign building, buying nothing but rookies every time. And that's going to mean, probably, that it's, it's going to be harder for me to maintain two-star units. It's going to be nearly impossible to maintain three-star units, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Or they'll just have to be smaller, right? Like, I'll just have to let them be less in terms of size than their uh, less skilled brethren. Okay. It is what it is. Um, you're going to take losses, and uh, it is what it is. You will. There will always be replacements, essentially, is, is the truth of the Union commander. And so the thing for you, your big expense, then, is guns, not dudes. Um, and now we were really in position and and notice that at 7 o'clock uh, we've, we've got like 10 minutes of video left or thereabouts and uh, there's a huge confederate command still ready to go we've now deployed wide so we have flankers we have troops holding the front we have a nice wide uh, position of mutually supporting Union infantry and a solid, at this point in time, I would say unshakable core of infantry at the top of a hill, shooting downhill, backed up by artillery with a commander fiasco kind of hanging out with them the entire time. So we're feeling really good. We're feeling really good right now. Um, my units are kind of getting rested. Those that are in position, the ones that are getting in position are obviously, you know, more warm, more tired. But we're not really going beyond warmed up for the most part. Uh, and in a lot of cases, still fresh. Um, yeah, so the Scott's attack here is a good example of what you can generally expect once you're in position. Uh, admittedly, getting in position is a slow, laborious, expensive, time-consuming process, but now we're here. Now we've secured this terrain, and in a real battlefield situation, at this point in time, the Confederate commander would almost certainly quit the field because we've seized, we've crossed the river and seized, you know, important, strategically important terrain. Yeah, they have the crossroads. Okay, whoop de shit we can go around it at this point. Um... As you'll see later when I'm defending the river in Gaines Mill, it's the river that determines the, the battlefield terrain. More than anything else. Um, okay, so that's, that's, that's that. That was moving across the river. This is a very, like, probably the hardest part of the battle, arguably. Um... We've talked about, like, what am I going to do or how are we going to divide, not divide, but, like, grow uh, the army over the, the next couple of battles. And I, uh, I've got to say, I am personally missing recon. So that's, right now for me, it's basically between medicine and recon. Um, we're already in the point in the campaign where I don't think putting points into veterancy, or sorry, no, training. I don't think putting points in training makes any sense. If you're going to go training, you want to go early, and you want to maximize the benefit of training to your command. And so given that I haven't done that, uh, <clears throat> given that I haven't done that, it 
I, I, I think that we just need to decide like that this is a campaign where I'm not going to put a lot of points into training. Um, and so the only things that make sense are medicine, because medicine is, in my opinion, like pseudo training. Um, it's a very efficient stat. Especially in a case of this, like this game, like this this army design, this army design philosophy is 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 one where I think medicine would probably be a very efficient stat because I'm gonna take losses, and not that I'm not that I'm saying like you should take medicine so you can get like you can be a little more callous with your men's lives, but if we're going to take losses and we're not gonna buy veterans. We should uh, then try and maximize as much as possible the uh, ROI from the lives or units that we do buy. And in my mind, the way to do that is medicine. Uh, and recon. Recon so that I can engage on favorable terms to me, uh, and or that I can see threats before they like ambush units or threats before they materialize. But then also so that my artillery can properly degun uh, the Confederates before we move to engage. So recon super important, and I and I think at this point in time like the toss up. I think these three stats are equally vital, and that's going to be Econ, Recon, <laughs> Econ, Recon, and Medics uh, for different reasons, but I think they all, they all more or less speak to the same thing, which is to say I'm trying to boost the efficiency of my command because I already know... I'm not going high training, so therefore I'm probably not going to be able to build an army of three-star uber soldiers. So I have to think about keeping the rookies that I do have alive. I'm going to bring in an army at Richmond, for example, with rookies that start at 12 in every stat or something. Then I need to find a way to equip them efficiently, which is where econ comes in. I need to find a way to maintain and keep the experience I do have because casualties are going to mount. Um, and I do that with with, uh, with medicine. And then I need to uh, also um, maintain and save my lives. And I do that with recon which is to say that it helps me engage intelligently instead of engaging blindly which would be what I might risk doing uh, without recon which for example this battle would be easier with recon because I would have been able to shell all of those skirmishers into oblivion uh, before crossing the river and this battle becomes much easier I think without those skirmishers skirmishers are like a huge force multiplier in my opinion um, they themselves cannot hold their own front, obviously, but they tend to kill like way they they tend to give better than they get by a long margin. Uh, so we're wrapping up on the fight here. Once you take both crossroads, they 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 run away. I really wanted to get all of the uh, I wanted to bag all these units, but it is what it is. I didn't really get much here worth my time. Um, 700 Lorenzes is definitely nice. Those are expensive rifles, and they definitely don't hurt. We get some dudes and some money. We only pick up one veterancy, which is on the on the Zouaves who have earned it. Uh, but but at the same time, like none of the units got slammed all that hard, except for Fifth Michigan and and maybe the Zouaves. But they they were already over strength, so they're they're now back to a number that I'm happy with. Um, yeah. So that's uh, that's River Crossing. This is a real bear of a fight, guys. So if you make it through, you know, congratulations, good luck. Uh, off to Crossroads for the next fight, which is also a real slugger of a fight. Knockdown, drag out, open terrain. It's rough. It's just getting your army ready for Shiloh, right? Like that's all it is. Uh, so 
yeah, I'll see you cats in the next one. But until then, I'm uh, excited to be back uh, on the recording rotation. And uh, this is Fiasco saying keep it real, and I'll see you on the field.